In this video, we're going to talk about Ed Sakota's trading rules. Stay tuned. Hey traders, a very warm welcome to you. Okay, so we're going to talk in this video about Ed Sakota's trading rules. A very famous trader. I believe he's still trading now. He was very famous several years ago. Trend trading guy with lots of kind of books on the subject. Interesting to see his trading rules. Now I've got my computer in front of me here because I want to read some of the quotes that he's mentioned about his trading as well as some of the rules that he has. Okay, so first of all, Number one, we have, he used a system that fits his personality. Do you know, if you're a subscriber to the channel, you are gonna know this is something I've talked about loads and you probably believe it yourself if you're a trader who's been trading for a while. You have to have a strategy that works for you as a person. Now, obviously he's talked about system here, his terminology, same thing, system, strategy, approach, setup, whatever. There's no point in trying to become a scalper if you don't like that quick decision making, you don't like that in front of the screen type action. Same, there's no point in becoming a swing trader if you don't like you know, the logical uh, making decisions slowly and maybe your skill set's not there. You get the point. You've got to find something that fits your personality. So he used a system that fit his personality and the something he said here was, systems don't need to be changed. The trick is for a trader to develop a system with which he is compatible. I couldn't agree more with his comment there. And let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below with, with his comment there is that, you know, the system is fine. It's how you do it. And if you're always second guessing your swing trading system because you're far used to scalping, or if you're always missing trades because you're, you know, trying to think too longly and make more of a, a case for going long when you've missed the scalp entry, it's not the system, it's how you're implementing it. And, and really you should be looking for a different kind of system. So that's a really good takeaway. I think if anything from here, uh, you know, using the right strategy that fits you as a person, as well as the market conditions. Anyway, let's move on. Number two, he kept losses super, super small. Um, <laughs> this is pretty much trading 101, guys, isn't it? You know, if you've been trading for a while, you know, that's just the key. You've got to cut those losses as quick as you can within reason. I know people say cut losses, you know, quickly within the reason of saying, okay, the trade is not working now. Uh, the thesis of the trade is wrong, I'm gonna cut it. And his comment was, hey, the elements of good trading are cutting losses, cutting losses, and number three, cutting losses. If you can follow these three rules, you may have a chance. And he's quite right. Most people are out of the game because they blow up due to taking excessive losses or one or two losses, or then don't get to the profitability level they want because several of their trades, you know, a handful of trades account for kind of 80% of their losses or 90 or even more of their losses. And, you know, that really just is the, is the thing that wipes them out completely. So he keeps his losses super, super small, which is a very good uh, kind of rule to live by, I think. Number three is he used mechanical systems to get long in bull markets. So he was a very mechanical trader. He used these mechanical signals to get buy and long and he would follow the trend. So he was a guy who would get on the trend very methodically, very mechanically, without much thought to it, and he would try and ride it, and he'd have a strategy for coming out with whatever it may be at the end of the trend. And he said here, uh, if I'm bullish, I neither buy on a reaction nor wait for strength, I'm already in. I turn bullish on the instant my buy stop is hit, and I stay bullish until my sell stop is hit. Being bullish and not being long is illogical. So he was very much a breakout trader. He wanted to get on the end of a trend. He would have a buy stop in, in other words, as the price pushed through a key level or whatever it may be out of a range or whatever type of strategy he had, he would be in automatically and that's it. He would stay in, he'd have his risk management place and he would ride that for as long as he was bullish. All right, what have we got now? We've got number four. He did not watch price action all day. His decisions were made at market close. I think this is a really good thing if you, uh, for, for, for many traders, obviously if you're a scalper, if you're an intraday trader, you need to watch price action all day because that's your edge. For most of us, if you're swing trading or if you're holding for multiple days, it doesn't do you any favors. You know when you're gonna come out of the trade if it hits your target. You know you've got a plan for coming out if the trade starts to not behave as you expected to, either if it comes down or if it starts you know, doing sitting in a time, got some sort of time-based stop. You should have those rules already. So there's no real reason to watch price action all day. You may have a rule in there that says, you know what, if we get a spike of X amount, I'm gonna look and I want to see this, this, and this to hold it all or take my profits, sure. But that's not watching price action all day. It's still very structured. And his decisions were made at the market close. Very wise 
if you're influenced by price action, if you're seeing stuff swinging around and you want to take the trade, you feel impulsive, you better to wait till things not, aren't happening. It's closed, you can make a decision. Hey, I wouldn't mind picking up some stock at this level under the market, I wouldn't mind buying a breakout here. You can be much more methodical and logical with your decision-making process than being emotional. And the comment he said on this was, um, where was he? And he said he didn't want, okay, having a quote machine is like having a slot machine at your desk. You end up feeding it all day long. I get my price data after the close each day. And that's a great uh, kind of analogy, slot machine thing. You know, you see in all these flashing lights and up and down and green, and it looks, it's like an entertainment thing for a lot of people. You gotta be careful of that. You wanna take it seriously, you wanna swing trade. It makes a lot of sense to me to be just trading based on close. And you don't have to obviously just the closing price, you can look at the day's chart and see, you know, what's happened intraday, but it stops you the impulse to trade because you can't trade if the thing's closed. And obviously for Forex, and some of the indexes that the trade 24 hours, it's a little bit different. Uh, for stocks, obviously this is supplies, but if you're trading 24 hours, then you know, you've still got the ability to trade. You maybe you don't want to make the decision, you still want to look at it, but then make the decision that, hey, I only place orders at 9 a.m., 3 a.m., 8, 8 p.m., whatever it may be, and have some sort of rules around that. All right, where are we? Number five, he used stops and trailing stops. So, he just used physical stop losses, so he'd obviously have a system and strategy breakout there as his stops, and he used trading stops to lock in his profits. And, he, and his comment is, you know, I set protective stops at the same time I enter a trade. I normally move these stops in to lock, uh, to lock in a profit as the trend continues. So he had some kind of trailing stop strategy to ensure that, hey, if he was in the trend and reverse completely, he wiped out all his profits. I would assume he's got those volatility adjusted for the trends, so he's not really aggressive with them, so the slight little dip he's out, because he's obviously in for the bigger trends. So like any good stop loss placement, he's got it outside of the expected noise, but in a place where it still protects his stops. It's that, it's that balance, isn't it, we, we try to get as traders. Number six, he's 1% risk per trade. So he, I didn't like, or he never risked more than 1% of a trading capital in one trade. Um, and he, you know, this is, I guess, it's kind of one of the things that you can either choose or not, depending on how much capital you've got. You know, if you've got a small amount of capital and you're starting out trading, okay to learn with, but you're probably never going to get the growth that you need. If you've got a large amount of capital, it makes perfect prudent sense. Anyway, he put here, speculate with less than 10% of your liquid net worth. I think that's probably quite a good number. Risk less than 1% of your speculative account on that trade. Uh, this tends to keep fluctuations in the trading account small relative to net worth. This is essential as large fluctuations can engage emotions and lead to feeling justifying drama. Very, very good point. Forget about the numbers here. A really good point. Speculating with a small amount of your net worth. That is the, the key, really, is, is put that very, very nicely. You know, when we get emotional about trading, it's because the value of the swing is quite a lot relative to our net worth. If you're worth several million, if you're worth 10 million and the trade is moving a thousand pounds up and down, are you going to be bothered about it? No, you couldn't care less. If your net worth is 10,000 and the trade is moving up a thousand up and down, you're on it like a, you're, you're, you're feeling pain, you're feeling joy. And that's really a good way of putting it is that, hey, you need to trade relative to what that money means to you, I think, or I suppose to net worth, what it means to you. Uh, and that's why, you know, we, we do feel emotional to it because, you know, often people say, oh, you know what, that's a, you know, that's a car, that's a, that's a this. And they start putting it in perspective of, of what it could be and how it could change them or how, it, how much value it's got to them. Whereas he's saying, listen, take 10% of your net worth. Uh, so, for example, he says, oh, your liquid net worth. So let's say, you know, you're, you know, you're worth a million, it says take 10% of that, so you stick 100 grand in your account, you're risking 1% of your account, so you're risking, you know, even less and less and less and less on each trade, so that it doesn't become meaningful to you, you're risking a grand on the account, it doesn't matter, you know, compared to what you're worth. So that's a really good kind of way of looking at it. Uh, and he's basically a technical a trader, and he relied on kind of psychology and price action for his edge, which made him uh, a pretty successful trader. So those are some of the rules that he used. If you've got any more, stick them in the comment section below. And as always, guys, keep the risk managed. Good trading. Take care. See you in the next one. Goodbye.